So, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is David Weinberger. We usually at these sessions go around and have everybody say a word about who they are, but we're not going to do that today because there are too many of you because Anil Dash is way, way too, too popular. <laughs> Completely deservedly so, by the way. Um, but I recognize many faces here, and I can assure you, assure you this is a really smart, interesting crowd. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, I am so, so happy to be able to introduce Anil, who I've followed for many, many years and who I admire vastly. He's a technologist, he's a writer, he's an entrepreneur, and in many ways, at least from my point of view, he, um, he embodies some of the very best values of the internet culture. Um, He's been blogging since 1999, which I think makes you officially an early blogger, a blogging pioneer. He's uh, one of the uh, founders or original employees. Founder, hmm. six apart. Mm. Hmm. Early employee. Early employee, early and very influential employee at six apart, which brought us movable type, which was uh, a really important, um, and still is, uh, blogging platform. Um, he has gone on to uh, many other deep and interesting things, including founding expert labs, uh, more or less at the, at the prompting of the Obama White House, um, and is currently uh, co-founder of ThinkUp. Um, and so I, I want to um, uh, just read one line, one sentence from his, uh, from his uh, homepage, his, his, um, uh, his site, Dashes, where he blogs. Um, but first, I want to remind you of the, of the rules here, which are few. The only thing you need to know is that this is being webcast. It will be uh, um, posted. So you feel free to say whatever you want. Just understand that this is fully, fully public. Um, there is a hashtag, the name of which I don't remember. What's the hashtag for this? The normal Berkman hashtag? Pound Berkman. Pound Berkman. There we go. Um, so that's, that's the one thing that you should know. So on, on Anil's um, page, he says, <clears throat> is by way of introducing himself, the highest use of new technologies is to empower people who are not born with the privilege of access to the institutions that define our culture. Not the normal sort of statement you find on an entrepreneur's site, but I think indicative of where Anil's heart is. So, Anil. Thank you very much. Uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's exciting to be here. This is not something I ever imagined getting the chance to do. So first of all, thank you all for your, your time and attention in the introduction. Um, I also, you know, it's great to get a room full of people that will uh, arrive at a conversation that's called the web we lost. Um, there's a lot of um, assumptions just in the name about us sharing a common context and a perspective on the web, or at least being willing to entertain that, that perspective on the web. And so I, I, I think there's um, a really exciting opportunity to have a great conversation about this. I, I thank you for your time. And I wanted to start first, I came up today, uh, last night from New York City uh, with a symbol that we see in New York City. Have any of you ever seen this symbol? How many of you know what it is? Anybody? One hand. What, what do you? It's the, isn't it the New York? No, I'm going to get filled up. Is this a symbol for the New York parks? You know, I thought it was too. Um, and it's not. This is the symbol for a privately owned public space in New York City. Uh, so if you go to if you go to nyc.gov slash pops, P-O-P-S, privately owned public space, uh, this is where this logo lives. And, you know, I had seen this everywhere around New York City, uh, thinking, oh, that means there's a park here, or I'm going to take my son there. And it actually means nothing of the sort. Um, uh, privately owned public spaces are exactly what they sound like. Uh, they exist because companies want to build buildings that are taller than the zoning regulations allow. And so they say, will uh, give you a, a, an easement on that regulation as long as you're willing to build a public space that people can use. So you end up with these aberrations like the Sony building being you know, 60, 80 stories tall and a nominal park which actually takes the form of their atrium. I call these things captive atria uh, where you can go and do things that are nominally public like uh, drink a coffee but not any of the things we'd associate with a true park. Um, this all becomes important in this whole conversation, but not least because one of the places that has this logo in front of it is Zuccotti Park. Park. 
So uh, certainly a lot of you are familiar with the name of Zuccotti Park uh, from the Occupy movement, uh, which had its flagship encampment at Zuccotti Park. And the reason that flagship encampment is no longer at Zuccotti Park is because that symbol's on it. It's a privately owned space. It does not exist as a public space as we know them. So this idea, the redefinition of a public space in order to meet the preferences or, or you know, the uh, goals of a private corporation um, is a refrain that comes through the entire conversation we're going to have today and uh, is, has been a, a recurring motif and, and this lens of looking at it through how we look at our physical civic institutions has been very, very helpful and instructive to me in reconsidering the ways I think about the web that we live and work and play on today. Um, especially because all of us can conflate the symbol for a privately owned space with the, sp the symbol for a public park. Uh, I think we do that a lot, and we need to understand what the distinctions are. The most important distinction between these spaces that we think are public and the ones that are privately owned is that uh, the constraint that the privately owned spaces introduced to us is they deny us the right to transgress. And this can happen in many different ways. Um, Typically, people want to talk here about public assembly, uh, about demonstrations, about marches, about occupying. I think those are all really important things. I think about folks like Improv Everywhere, right? So they're doing art in public spaces, sometimes comedy in public spaces. And in order to assert what they do that is culturally valuable to perform their art, they have to frequently mislead people about their identity misrepresent their identity. They need to masquerade as someone else. They need to be able to operate anonymously or during times and places when people aren't supposed to have access. That's in order to perform things that are entertaining, amusing, kids safe. And so this is a really key underpinning of what we expect a public space to be able to let us do is transgress. And transgression isn't always just the the, you know, the moments where you're having a march, it is these everyday things that are fun and entertaining and, and make life a little more, more livable. And it's important to me to understand how we transform spaces from what looks like parks or public space into private spaces. And the lens, again, for this that uh, was most instructive in seeing how the transformation happened was to imagine a secretive private Ivy League club. Uh, I am very flattered and excited to be here, but uh, as I was speaking to folks earlier today, one of the things that is probably not as familiar to all of you that get to sit in this room on a regular basis or in the buildings around here is this is an intimidating place to be. I didn't graduate from college. I'm the son of immigrants. This is not uh, the place that I'm supposed to be uh, speaking, uh, certainly not uh, on this side of the room. And so it's very easy to forget how uh, even a space as welcoming as this one, can seem intimidating and closed off to the vast majority of people in society. And this is particularly true when I look at where I spend my time online. Facebook was constructed explicitly as a secretive private Ivy League club. Right? And I'm supposed to feel flattered and rewarded that it now allows me to come in. Uh, but I don't always feel that way. Sometimes I feel like it's still yours I'm glad to be allowed to participate in it, but it's never going to be mine, and it's never going to be a place of me. And almost all of the tools that we use in the technology world and the social networking world have a very hard time transcending what they were originally created to support. If this is what you were originally created to support, how far can you get from the origins of what you were sort of born to be? And it's especially important because of what people do inside the secretive club. And the way that most of our social networks work, I think this is actually the outcome, the wholesale destruction of your wedding photos. I picked this one because this is really um, this visceral image for me of every time you watch a local news story about somebody having a house fire or apartment fire, and they'll talk about, we grab the kids and the pets and a box of photos. We had our wedding photos. We got the pictures. Everything else we can replace, right? Everything else is just stuff. Let's say it all the time. These are our memories. This is who we are, our, our physical selves, our photos, and everything else is just stuff. And it's especially striking because every single day we hear about a social networking service that 
succeeds. And what the conventional tech industry and the Silicon Valley startup industry defines as success is one, you sell to one of the big social networks, and two, you delete everybody's wedding photos that they stored on your service. Right? So Posterous is a blogging service that did very well, therefore they sold to Twitter, and I don't know if it was last week or next week, but they're about to shut down and delete every wedding photo that's ever been stored on their service. And there are countless precedents for this. There are many, many startups. In fact, the conventional thing to do is to say, good news, community. Number one, we're all going to be rich. Two, you're not getting paid. Three, we're going to delete your wedding photos. Right? We've all gotten those emails. And we've all gotten them multiple times. So think about the mismatch here. You see people on the worst day of their lives tearfully telling the news reporter on the camera, well, we got our photos and we're all OK. Right? And on the other hand, we all have in our inbox every single day somebody saying, we're going to delete this stuff. By the way, don't call us. We're on our private island now that we're rich. That's fascinating. That's an incredible dichotomy. And that line just never gets connected. Is there, they're throwing away the thing that we say we care most about. And of course, why do they do this? They're allowed to, because the terms of service, right? Terms of service that none of us really read. Well, in this room, there's a couple people that read them. But really, in a normal room, you know, we don't read them. And, uh, you know, there's ambiguity as to whether they're enforceable at all. But the reality is the terms of service essentially give them carte blanche. And we all know this. They can do whatever they want, whenever they want. And, you know, we're, we're, our option is that we can sort of, you know, take a hike if we don't like it. And I wanted to recontextualize this as this is the, the common state of affairs. We're all familiar with these issues. We're all familiar with uh, uh, the challenges around this. But we tend to look at this as simply the cost of doing business or the reality of uh, the web ecosystem as it is today. And I wanted to reframe this in an important way as this is actually a battle. This is a battle against values that the early social web had. And I'm talking about a time about a decade ago. It may have ended as late as 2005, but between, say, 1999 and 2005, there was the creation of the social web. And this is the, the rise of everything from blogging tools to uh, uh, social photo sharing like Flickr um, and the host of other things that eventually got branded Web 2.0 and turned into um, the social web we have today. And I got to be witness to it. You know, I was a blogger, as David said, early on. And the interesting thing for me about int being introduced as a blogger is it's a little bit, these days, like being introduced as an emailer. Right? It's, not a, <laughs> it's not really a meaningful introduction. It's like, this is something hundreds of millions of people do. What do you mean? And part of the reason I cling to that as an identity is there was a time when it was a statement of identity. It was a meaningful thing to say, I do this task because the community shared values, because the action was uncommon enough that it distinguished you and who you were. And that is something that's completely evaporated in our perception of what the web is. Right? Nobody's a Facebooker. It's not something everybody ever introduces themselves as being. You might say somebody's a tweeter, but probably not in a positive sense. And, and so that idea that there was a commonality, there was a culture, there were a set of values that were shared uh, is really important to understanding how they could have been systematically dismantled. So now, if you're going to make a statement like they're systematically dismantling the values of community, can we show how that's true? First starting point, we have a lot of software that forbids journalism. How many of you have an iPhone like I do? Got one, a bunch of them, right? So um, this is an excerpt from the iOS App Store's uh, Terms of Service for Developers whenever they submit it. And I'll, I'll read this for the benefit of those who can't see it. Apple says, and again, all the grammar errors here are theirs. Uh, <laughs> we view apps different than books or songs, <laughs> which we do not curate. If you want to criticize a religion, write a book. If you want to describe sex, write a book or a song, I like the song there, or create a medical app. That's Apple's stated policy. All of us are consuming apps, purchasing apps, and supporting an economy with this as its presumption. The great thing about this is it's so sort of open-ended. Who knows what's even enforceable here? Uh, it gives a lot of discretion to Apple. But I like the idea that if you want to criticize a religion, write a book. Right, because that can presumably be sold to the iBook store, so they don't really have an aversion to you distributing it, just not in executable form. I wonder why that is. That's weird, right? 
why are people who write software different than people who write books? And why are people who do both, like me, expected to follow different rules in these different contexts? Because we all know software actually can do a very, very good job of engaging and activating people to perform different actions. And this has been proven to be what Apple enforces. So if you look at something like the Drones app, which shows the loca you know, locations where drone strikes have taken place from American drones, uh, they prohibited it from, hap from being distributed through the App Store. So there's precedent here where they're saying, look, that kind of journalism, even though it doesn't violate these, the drones aren't actually sex. Um, they, they, they don't really say why, but it's like, well, that kind of journalism isn't what we on an app to do. So we've, dr we've drawn this distinction in kind between what formerly lived in the world of publishing and what lives as apps. And so certain types of speech, certain types of expression are constrained when they're in executable code as distributed by these networks. That's a really powerful concession. And the language here, it's not usually this explicit, but we have the explicit language. This is something every iOS developer whose app you've ever downloaded has agreed to. And then there are the things that are a little less visible, which is shaping the law to make the way we like to control our data illegal. The most pressing example about this is the conflation of acts that were formerly speech with things that are published as works. Right? So what we do is we bring public discourse into the realm of IP law through the terms of service and through the ways the services treat our, our communication. And there's a lot of parts here I want to tease out, and I'm not an expert in this by any means, but I'll take the parts that are, that are most relevant here. First is obviously all the social networks try to operate as common carriers. They want to see themselves as neutral substrates for the information they transfer between people, except when it comes to monetizing it. Right? At this point, it becomes a work. And this is really important because there's no real clear boundary here. So I can clearly sit at home with my son and sing him happy birthday, and that's allowed. I can do that in a slightly mediated way if I had been out of town for his birthday where I could have done it over FaceTime. And I clearly can't put it up on YouTube with me singing happy birthday to him because then it's a work. So those are pretty well defined. Uh, somewhere in between, maybe there's a vine. That's only six seconds, so that's kind of short. So maybe that's okay. What if the FaceTime was really laggy and it ended up being stored or cached along the way on the network? What if I accidentally had enabled a feature or they had a software bug where it could be publicly broadcast by people that chose to tune into it, but I didn't do it on purpose? There's this really open-ended area where we get into like the speed of transmission of the network and where its things are cached starts to decide as to whether this is a work that they're going to monetize or that people can uh, sue me for violating their IP uh, rights around, or whether this is just speech between people. And of course, all of the uh, things we can think about when people are wearing wearable cameras and monitoring devices. There's a really obvious evolution here. These are a lot of these tenets of this reckoning are very familiar to us. But the most important part here is now we have the industry that creates the social networks explicitly wanting to get involved in the way that IP law evolves. So Open people are the most telling example of this. But when, for example, Google puts on their homepage a request that people call their senators or write their senators about SOPA and PIPA, or when Wikipedia shuts down its homepage in order to encourage action there, what you have is the scenario that we, those of us that thought Citizens United was a bad decision, were fighting against. Corporations explicitly saying, influence this policy in the direction of our interests. And yet, most of us in the tech world cheered when they did so. Right. So we said, please, Google, one of the biggest companies in the world, please, Facebook, one of the biggest companies in the world, encourage people to influence IP policy in the way that you prefer. Encourage them to call your senators. And when you do so, we will congratulate you and thank you and reward you for doing so. And we do this even at the same time as they take our ordinary speech, where we're talking to each other on our Facebook walls, or sending each other messages through Gmail, and turning them into works that live under the IP regime that we already think is unfair. So that's a pretty radical shifting of the goalposts that's happening that we're complicit in. right? We actually cheer them on when they, when they do this thing that, in any other context, if they'd put a, a bumper in front of our DVDs or our films in the theaters saying, call your senator and tell them to adjust the IP laws in favor of the MPAA or the IAAA, we would have been 
probably um, protesting out front of their offices. And this is a pretty dramatic shift that's happened without us really objecting very much at all. Then there's the technological changes. Um, if you go back a decade ago, 2005 or so, uh, metadata was all the rage. It was in fashion amongst the geeks. Right? So what you could do with a Flickr photo when you took a photo, you could geotag it, you could just tag it with a free text word, you could do machine tags. All these incredible things bubble up. So you start to get, even today, when somebody makes a mashup, here's all the photos in a certain location, they always do it on Flickr because you can't do it on Instagram because the metadata are thrown away or locked into Instagram's APIs when you do it. And you know, part of this was Flickr was from the old web. They were from that small community. And they said, we want to share these ideas. We want to share the ability to do these things. It's the reason you still can do that Creative Commons search. Every single one of these images on this slideshow is that Flickr Creative Commons search. I'm sure all of you have done, too, for presentations. And you can't do it on Instagram because they don't care about metadata. And they succeeded, right? They just, whatever it was, a dozen kids make an app, and they sold it to Facebook for a billion dollars, and that's defined as success. Um, but this is true on many, many levels, right? Um, to be invited by Berkman to speak for me always, you know, can't go without remarking about RSS and it, you know, the spec that lives at, at um, the Berkman Center and say, you know, you can debate the sort of RSS is dead thing on the technological front, but the reality, and this is something we'll revisit later, is that from an end user standpoint, clearly, this isn't something any end user has chosen. Some of this is our abdication on the technological front of making open formats as appealing or making metadata-rich experiences as appealing as those. But the reality is these companies are not going to invest in metadata that makes information discoverable or easily shareable. There's even more fundamental corruptions of these systems through economics. So uh, at the birth of the social web, links were editorial. They were artistic. They were voice. Any of you remember uh, Suck.com from the olden days, the old timers? Yeah, great site, right? So you remember hyperlinks in Suck? And they were always these sort of snarky, you had to hover on it to see where the link went, and you'd be like, oh, that's actually a punchline. That's not just a link, right? It's really clever. And now when you hover on a link, it's to the internal tag page for the New York Times aggregation page around this story. Right, so like, I wanted to read the text of this law. Well, no, it's not that. This is their tag page about that story. And the reason why is, is search engine optimization in Google. But the fundamental thing that happened here is with the introduction of AdSense and AdWords, Google converted the meaning of links from purely editorial, purely expressive, purely artistic, into something that is economic and immediately transformed what links were. Uh, back at, at that time, I was making blogging software, and we used to, you could just put whatever link you wanted to in a comment because you wanted to send people to your site and check it out. And link spam happened overnight. It went from there was no reason anybody would ever paste a link into a comment form on the web into something happening on every single site that we worked with in less than six months. Right? So link spam it happens, and all the other things that happen around the SEO happen almost immediately when links are converted into an economic statement. Now, that was what the sort of combination of links with PageRank and with an economy did with Google 10 years ago. Today, Facebook has what they call EdgeRank, I think. And it's based on the idea that likes are an expression of your intent. Likes are what you like. Likes are how you feel about that page or that site or that company or that brand or that cause that you have clicked on purely editorial, purely artistic, except being used as the fuel for their economic engine as to how they rank things in your news stream and what they charge advertisers on their platform. Right? So we're in a direct parallel <laughs> to what happened with links 10 years ago. We're going to see like spammers. We're going to see the like engine optimi optimizers. We're going to see uh, the rise of fake likes and like fraud and all the other things that we saw with links uh, going back 10 years ago. And this could be you know, Twitter favorites. This could be whatever, you know, uh, I'm sure it'll happen on YouTube when you, when you favorite or star a story there or, or Tumblr hearts. But the reality is these gestural things that used to be editorial and an actual indication of people's intent get corrupted very, very quickly in these economies. And they take away ways we have of expressing with one another in a social context. Again, the exceptions where you look at Flick, Flickr through this sort of benevolent stagnation under its time with Yahoo, um, favorites on Flickr still mean favorites, and they probably will because they're not going to find a way to monetize those, probably, 
very soon. But aside from those little islands that's sort of the, um, you know, the Galapagos of the social web, um, for the most part, as they're evolving and trying to monetize things, we're going to see these gestures that used to be about me telling you I liked your work turn into economic actions that then get divorced entirely from the original context. And it's especially important to think about how links get transformed and likes get transformed by this economy when we think about these interactions. And I'm going I'm to read part of this. This is um, by context. Uh, when you, I, I wrote a post on my blog um, about 18 months ago that um, got shared a lot on Facebook. And when people clicked on the link from Facebook to get to my site, they got this message that I'll read in part. Please be careful. For the safety and privacy of your Facebook account, remember to never enter your password unless you're on the real Facebook website. Also, be sure to only download software from sites you trust. To learn more about staying safe, here's some links. And then it says you can go through to my site if you go ahead and click Continue. So you've probably seen this. Have you ever clicked on a Facebook link and seen something like this? A warning and be careful. So there's a couple interesting parts here. The, the underpinning here, the assumption that Facebook is making is that my site is less trustworthy than theirs. That alone I take some issue with, right? <laughs> but let's grant that. Let's say it's true. Let's say I'm trying to steal all your privacy and they're not. Um, the, <laughs> The, the interesting part here is on my site, as today as then, I have Facebook comments. And to have Facebook comments, you actually have to add in you know, little bits of metadata to your site, the uh, open graph tags that they have. You have to essentially register with them and tell them I'd like to work within the Facebook ecosystem. And only then, after they val validated and verified your page, do they even allow the comments to display. So I had explicitly opted into the Facebook ecosystem. Part of this was to prove that I'm not an extremist, like I'm a moderate on these things. I'm not a radical. Part of this was because it's a service to my readers. A lot of them use Facebook, and this is the way they could talk about it and share it with their friends. So there's a convenience factor. I was seduced and am by the same things that we all are while we use the networks. And so I was part of that narrow slice of the web that had explicitly gone to them and said, here I am. Here's who I am. Here's me vouching for the fact I'd like to participate in your ecosystem. And this happened around the same time as they'd introduced the social reader apps that I'm sure some of you remember. The Washington Post and The Guardian would let you read the stories within the context of Facebook, and it would sort of promote at the top of your timeline and be a little bit spammy, but you'd see those stories, right? And those sites, when you read the Washington Post story entirely within the wrapper of the Facebook experience, never got this warning message. It never said anything about this site might be, not be trustworthy. It certainly never said anything about whether the information on that site might be trustworthy. But even though I'd opted in, they gave this warning to people, scaring them off, saying, you shouldn't click outside our walls. Right? You probably shouldn't leave Facebook because it's not safe. This is the safe place. They do that to the sites that register with them. What do they do to the sites that don't even register with them? The majority of the web. This is something that I was stunned by, and, and, and the response actually from them was interesting. I, you know, I wrote about it because, again, I have the privilege of doing so, and I have a little bit of an audience enough to amplify it. And um, I got a you know, sort of you know, friend of a friend email, oh, you know what, this is just a software bug. It wasn't supposed to do that. It's supposed to have the little, uh, you know, some, something added to your link that says this one's OK. He's, he's all right. He's with us. Um, and you know what, I believe them. I actually don't, like, I don't think it was malicious. I don't think they were saying, let's screw this one guy's tiny blog. I think they just didn't care. But the striking thing about this was, that means in the best case, all of us are fixing bugs in Facebook software with our time and energy, and they're not. Because there's no way to report a bug like this. There's no way to even troubleshoot and test enough to know that it's a bug. Right? If they hadn't had somebody that wanted to save face there, do the work and look into the software, um, I wouldn't have even known this was an issue. That's the best case scenario, is we're fixing their bugs. The worst case is they are deliberately trying to shunt traffic away from those who don't participate fully in their ecosystem, don't give their content over to being consumed within the network. And that's, again, that's one of those clear, OK, this is how the social networks work. But this is true across the board for all the things that compete with the web. The social networks compete with the open web. And of course, the apps that we talked about at the top compete with the web. Right? So we know ideas locked into apps won't survive the acquisition. The first thing you do when you succeed in Silicon Valley and your company is acquired 
is you destroy everybody's wedding photos. Right? But this is true at the device level, too. Right? We've, we've increasingly coupled our content and our expression to devices that uh, get obsolete more and more quickly. Right? So we have ways of expressing ourselves. Where it's like, at a simple level, well, this app requires a retina screen now, and so everybody has to upgrade and do these things. And when you get to this, this sense of these new devices, um, formats get harder and harder to preserve. And this is especially true when there are these proprietary um, or under-documented formats, right? Because we've given up on formats. I know there's a lot of work here around everything from, like I said, RSS to you know, eBooks to, to open formats. But the reality is those of us that cared about this stuff, and I spent many years working on open formats around all the different ways of social sharing, have lost. Overall, we've lost. Very, very few of the consumer experiences that people use or the default apps that come with their devices work around open formats. There's some slight exceptions around photos. Obviously, JPEG is doing pretty well. Um, HTML is doing OK. But the core interactions of a small, short status update or the ability to tell somebody you like something, those things aren't formats or protocols at all. They're completely undocumented. They can be changed at any time. Uh, and there isn't even the expect expectation that they would be interoperable. That is perhaps the most dramatic shift from the early days of the social web. There, the table stakes, even for the big players, was the expectation that you would come to a meeting with a bunch of other geeks and hash out some way for things to interrupt. That was how the web was built in its first decade, maybe its first 15 years. And it went away really, really quickly with almost no public discourse about the implications of it. Geeks talked about it as a, an unfortunate technological development, but not at the cultural or social level. So this is the underpinning. There's an enormous amount of changes that are happening. There's this really intentional pulling away from and you know, things like formats, open formats, because they are destabilizing to the power of these networks, right? They make they lower switching costs, all the kind of classic calculations we have here. But the most important implication of these things is when we think about what these networks are trying to function as, as public spaces. And I've worked on this too, where you know, the, the president will do a Twitter town hall or a Google Hangout or go to Facebook's office and sit next to Mark Zuckerberg. And we treat these things as public spaces. Town hall right, indicates this is public space. But if we think about privately owned public spaces, we know that dissent and transgression are not permitted. And so what we end up with is the combination of the terms of service plus the evolution of IP laws are actually trumping the Constitution in our public discourse. There are things that these networks can preclude us from saying and have the ability to preclude us from saying that formerly were speech but are no longer speech. Right? Through these apps, through these social networks, there's an incredible shift. And um, one really useful way to think about this is Every single message you said about the election on Facebook when you got into that debate with your in-laws could have been transformed by Facebook on the server into saying the opposite, and that would be within their rights. Right? Now, people would maybe object to that, but they would certainly be allowed to do that. Similarly, Apple would reserve the rights to say, we're not going to let you say these things through these apps, or we're not going to permit apps in the store that let you say these things. And that would be something that they could shift through their current terms of service. You can argue about there being the open web, the rest of the web, the rest of the things that don't go through the app store as a place to carry on the discourse. But when public officials themselves are using these networks, this is a really, really important constraint. So I live in New York City. After Sandy, we had local officials talking about relief efforts that were only being broadcast as messages through Facebook. Right? A lot of infrastructure was down. And Facebook was very valuable there. I don't want to diminish the important value that these networks give to society. But you had to be locked into Facebook to see where public relief was happening in the wake of an emergency. Right? That's a striking change. And, and then there's the disposability factor, the wedding photos factor. Like, you know, I kind of don't care about the elected officials that much. I, you know, we talk about the, you know, the, the Occupy stuff and the elected officials, but I'm, I'm talking about everyday things. This is the, you know, the improv everywhere, or the prank you want to play on your friend, or the birthday notice, or singing happy birthday to your kid. Those are the things that I'm much more concerned about. The everyday person's interactions are what's most at risk here, and the ways of expressing ourselves that are just 
not possible, like creating links that are not about shooting for the SEO economy, or creating likes that aren't about optimizing our like strategy. And the classic response to all this is just opt out. Are there any uh, uh, ex-Facebook users here, people that have quit? Never yeah. been on Facebook. Never, Never been, been. yeah. Yep. Abstainers, I respect that very much. But that's like, you know, you're 70% of all the abstainers in the country are in this room. <laughs> um, and I, you know, like I, I've thought, oh, I want to be one, but I'm also like, I don't want to martyr myself to not being able to interact with my in-laws either. Right? I, they got a grandson, they got to see him. All right, I'm on Facebook. And that is the most obvious cost, right? the social cost. But there are opportunity costs. There's incredible career costs. Right? I'm a technologist, but if, even if I weren't, could I do my job without being on LinkedIn, without being on Twitter? Like, could, I, could I meaningfully uh, expand the sphere of opportunities that I have open to me? Um, in a very real way, the beginnings of being on the social networks, um, if I hadn't participated in the blogosphere, I wouldn't be in this room today. There wasn't some other path for me to get here. I, didn't, I wasn't in academia and I wasn't qualified in those regards. The way that my ideas could be discovered was because I was early on a network that ended up being successful and valuable. And you know, this pattern repeats over and over. Um, people talk about me having you know, a, a larger number of Twitter followers than most folks. The, the main reasons why is I was early on that network and the people who created that network put me on their suggested user list and privileged me to have more followers, right? So those are, now I was fortunate to be in place to be able to take advantage of those opportunities and I had my own privileges to get there. But those things are not level playing fields today. And so there's a lot of social costs not being on these networks. There's also a really important point that always gets overshadowed. This is sort of a fairly like-minded group, people who are very literate in these topics. The main reason that this shift happened in the social web, I think, is the arrogance of the people that cared about the open web in the early days. And you know, having been in the room for many of these conversations, I remember when open ID was created and open social and all these sort of open whatever, like you could put open in front of anything and people would have gotten behind it, you know? And we, we did sincerely care about enabling all these positive things for users. We wanted to pr protect and preserve these things for users. But the way that we went about it effectively ended up being so arrogant that Mark Zuckerberg's vision seemed more appealing, which is extraordinary, right? Like, again, for me to think a guy that made a, a private club for, for Ivy League kids to rate each other's attractiveness was more appealing than what I was working on and more inclusive really rocked a lot of my assumptions about how we went about building technology. Some of this was usability and user experience and just simplicity and design. Those are all important. But some of this was how we told the story, what we thought mattered, the way we went about talking about these things. And I, you know, I, I, I look back a lot at the despite all the positive things that have happened from the social web, um, some of the missed opportunities around encouraging po you know, positive contributions and, and, and making a true public space. And I have to think that if we had been listening more and if we had been a little more open in self-criticism, um, it would have been really valuable. And this refrain keeps coming back. Even with the SOPA and PIPA conversation a year ago, there was a lot of triumphalism about the geeks won, right? They, they impacted policy in the way they preferred. But to get there required an extraordinary amount of hyperbole, right? We had to say, this is a threat to the First Amendment. Free speech is being destroyed. And, you know, maybe it's true, but it's a little bit exaggerated. It's a little bit amplified. And it worked that once, but does anybody think we could do that again every time we needed to? It doesn't scale, right? So that... That willingness to pat ourselves on the back uncritically and say, look, we won. We beat the evil movie industry. It's like, these are our allies. These were early free speech advocates, right? The, the, the creative industries and music and movies. They, that we should identify with them as artists and that we're vilifying them seems like somebody's getting over a pretty good trick on us. 
It's like our biggest enemies are people who support creative industries. It's like that can't be the case. And again, that comes from this arrogance of, well, they're dinosaurs, they're a legacy industry. Um, I know people in this room tend to be a little more evolved in their thinking, but the people that we count on to rally behind our efforts, um, they don't see us being publicly critical of one another or critical of ourselves. And I think that that's one of the reasons it didn't work. That's one of the reasons that the open web sort of faded away is it wasn't as compelling a vision as what can be told by those who would rather control it. And for something to seem less inclusive than an effort, like I said, with Facebook or Apple, who are incredibly insular cultures, incredibly arrogant cultures, they're not you know, egalitarian in the ways they look at creating technology at all, and they still were more appealing, I think that's something that we should look at very, very seriously um, with some reflection and, and, and try to understand why, uh, why it was that their vision was more appealing. The other defensive thing a lot of us want to say is well, it's only some of the web, right? It's just Facebook, it's just Twitter. You can get by fine without it. People in this room do, right? Um, and it's funny because this assumption comes from the idea, again, from those early days that we built the social web for pages. The web was made for pages, right? It's meant to publish academic papers. That's what it was designed to do. And we think of pages, and I always think of like something like this, right? This sort of classic web page layout, a bunch of boxes like the New York Times homepage. <laughs> And an interesting happen thing that happened in the past decade is this model of what a web page looks like has shifted to this, to a stream. This is increasingly how we consume our information. Um, if we think about whether it's on our mobile phones or where we spend the day cruising up and down in the browser, there are all these narrow single column streams of the information we want to consume that we're constantly refreshing. And this starts about a decade ago. If we look at the last 15 years, um, we can look at the things that pop up. You sort of, um, you have Blogger in 1999, and that's sort of the first, like this is a reverse hierarchical classic stream of information. Uh, and then Gmail actually becomes stream in 2004. It's one of the most radical things, why people didn't like the original Gmail inbox. <coughs> Twitter, of course, pops up in 2006. And we go on and on through Facebook, through Tumblr, through Pinterest, through LinkedIn, um, through YouTube. And the interesting thing that happens here around this, this time point of 2010, 11, 12, is you go from sites that already existed, like LinkedIn and YouTube, but were pages, and they shift to being streams, right? So the homepage of YouTube, YouTube's embedded on more sites than any other widget anywhere on the web. So they have tons and tons of data. Google has all the data in the world. And they take something that used to be a regular set of pages, and if you go right now, you go to your YouTube homepage, take a look, it's a stream of stuff that's the most recently updated at the top. Um, most dramatic one to me was a couple weeks ago. Was Yahoo, right, changes their homepage to a stream. So this behavior across the board has shifted. Meanwhile, the media industry is still making pages. And those of us that talk about this stuff from the theory standpoint are still making pages. These are experienced by users, these streams, as apps. They feel like apps. They don't feel like pages, right? So the fundamental model of what we think the web is is wrong. And this is, again, that example of us saying, we know how the web works, we're the geeks, we're the technologists, and users choosing something different. Because if you look at this time frame of time spent for users, what percentage of their time online is spent in a stream experience, it just goes up and up and up, right? So it crosses about half the time people spend online in 2010 is in a stream-based experience, right? And it's gonna probably be about three quarters, it's a little bit of an estimation here on the, on the right end of this chart. But the percentage of time spent online and the way people spend that time is by looking for the next item in a stream. And yet, most of our conversations ignore that reality. And in fact, this number is probably even higher if we consider phones. Every single thing you read on your phone is just you going up and down through some stream of information. And the reason this is important is these streams are controlled access. These are limited access highways. These are things where they control the on-ramp and they control the formatting, and they control the way that you can design it, and your Facebook page can be whatever color you want as long as it's blue. And this is part of the mechanism through which they are constraining the conversation. And we sort of don't really talk about it. This is, again, another one of those mismatches between what the, the you know, open web advocacy community says and what users actually do. Nobody with open web values has made 
anywhere near as popular or useful or compelling a stream as any of these providers. And in fact, we all rely on them for our distribution. So I can have my independent blog, but if it's not being promoted through one of these networks, nobody sees it. If it's not being in one of these streams, injected in a format that's consumable in one of these streams, that's compatible with what they call native advertising, which is the stream items that are ads, then it doesn't get seen. It's a really big issue. And so the pattern that, you, that the geeks tend to have here is they say, let's, fix the la let's fight the last war. Let's fix the last battle. Let's go and make an open source version of that old thing, right? And this is what, when people make a diaspora, when people make an app.net or whatever their reflexive reaction is, they say, let's make one of the old ones. And what they need to do is say, what's a new kind of stream that would be compelling enough for normal people to use? Because normal people never switch apps. They might adopt new ones, and those might slowly displace their old ones, but they never switch apps. And they certainly never switch to something that is a open source replacement that's better than the old one. And the exception everybody wants to point to is Mozilla, and it happened once with Firefox. And IE had to be the worst browser in the history of the internet. And Microsoft had to be one of the most evil companies in the history of the technology industry. If you can create that circumstance again, great. But you probably won't. So that's all of the bad news, right? You should be sufficiently depressed at this point to say, you know, we're doomed, right? And, and the question always comes up, so is it just over? Right? Do we just give up? Right? Is, is, is Facebook and LinkedIn and, and Twitter the new ABC, NBC, and CBS? And I don't think so necessarily. And part of the reason why is I do believe social technologies follow patterns. And the, and the technology industry as a whole is cyclical. These things come around. And once you understand that, you understand the pendulum from, in the same way that we go uh, from mainframes being rebranded as the cloud, um, we start to think about something like personal computing, and we think there is going to be an analogy where people pull things from the cloud into some area that they have more control and programmability about. Will it be called personal? Maybe. Will it be called computing? Almost certainly not. But we can absolutely imagine that cyclicality taking place again. And um, Gosh, Google couldn't be doing a better impersonation of Micro Circa late 90s than if they tried, right? They have two operating systems. Nobody understands why. They're throwing everything with the kitchen sink out there. Microsoft used to make car software back then, too, right? And everybody's like, you know, they're like, they're explicitly trying to become the evil empire, but they kind of don't realize it. Um, so, like, that's great. So, we have to recognize there's going to be a similar correction. There's going to be a similar um, general public feeling of overreach on the part of Google. We say, you know, they're making me feel itchy in the way that Microsoft did back in 1997, and something's going to be done about it. And the striking thing here is, in that case, policy really worked. Right? The consent decree, you look at 2001, 2002, um, the changes and the impact it had on Microsoft is that now Chrome is the number one browser in the world. Right? IE is an afterthought for developers. They get to it, but they get to it last, after Chrome, after Firefox, after mobile Safari. right? So some of the, and, and you know, the geeks always want to blame this on the shift to mobile or whatever. The reality is public policy can be a really, really effective part of addressing the problems in the technology industry. I think the browser wars demonstrates that really effectively. And we're going to see that similarly with policy around social networking. And it's coming. There's no question about it. Not least because everybody's so libertarian in Silicon Valley that they're doing no job of preparing for it. It's also this idea that apps want to do the right thing. I mean, this is my sort of you know, shameless plug. I'm working on one called ThinkUp that I'm hoping demonstrates this. But there's a lot of software that is trying to embody the values of the social web. And this is, again, that cyclicality. People respond to this. Now, the problem is it's been expressed as the like once a year Kickstarter for some app that says, screw Facebook, give us 50 bucks. And that tends to work. And a bunch of geeks get on you know, Hacker News and they give to it. And, they do where they don't ship an app. Usually they never ship anything, and nobody ever uses it, and then they try again the next year. Um, that pattern has got to end. And, and part of the reason that it's been ineffective so far is people haven't made apps that people want from the open web community. Right? They make science projects. Um, they make toolkits. Um, and, and I think we need to, uh, again, be much more critical of people creating in the open web vein and say, are you making something people want to use every day that a normal person would want to use every day? Are you speaking with respect? Are you being more sensitive and attentive to what users want than Mark Zuckerberg is? You know, 
than Jack Dorsey is. I think it's important to ask those questions. Um, but there are apps out there that want to do the right thing. We need to shepherd them and coach them into doing things in a way that's appealing to people. Now, at least because we count on very, very young people to do this, right? We talk to 23-year-olds and we ask them to do this. And one of the hard things to keep in mind is they were in fifth grade when the stuff was working as the open web did in its beginning. They don't remember. They weren't allowed to. They weren't open, old enough to get into the sign-up process to be able to see how Flickr worked at the beginning, right? And so it's very, very easy to overlook um, the fact that there isn't a cultural learning here. There are very, very few places, even if they have a great education. You go to the best schools in this country, and this is one of them, it's very hard to learn the history of the personal software industry. You can learn about the business side. You can learn about the rise of Microsoft and the consent decree and the DOJ case, and you can learn about how they built HP and all those kinds of, you know, they were in a garage and what they did. But how software impacted culture, what did happen with the desktop office suite wars? in the 80s and the 90s. There's very, very little literature. And the striking thing about this is that's true despite the fact that the principal actors in these battles are still alive, still active in the software industry, right? The inventors of the spreadsheet and, the, and, the, uh, and PowerPoint and Microsoft Word, they're all still alive and active and you can email them. And even despite that being true, we can't learn from them about what does it look like when you go through a battle with other competitors where you know, users are at stake and, and how does it impact once you actually get to the point where um, somebody wins and the network gets, you know, the, 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 the monopoly power gets all the power. These are things that um, we need to think about as, as important a part of technology education as the bits and bytes and how you make the apps. And one of the other principles that I think people are starting to understand at a sort of cultural level is that we can learn things from observing ourselves, right? So, you know, people call it quantified self, which is like, I, I can't imagine a less attractive way to describe the behavior uh, you know, of, 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 of keeping track of what you do. But, but there is an instinctive feeling of like, well, if I keep track of what I eat every day, I might lose some weight. And if I see how far I'm managing to run when I get off the couch, it might encourage me to get off the couch a little more often. And interestingly, we don't look at any of our online social behaviors as quantifiable parts of ourself. It's, it's the strangest thing. The thing that's already digital, that already exists in a computer, we don't have any way of saying, like, am I spending more time on these networks than I did yesterday? Am I spending more time consuming streams than pages? And, and we rely on some like, marketing company to give us these broad stats, or you know, we, we hope to find the right Pew report that somebody's already created for us. Um, and it's striking because like, it's much easier for me to track my heart rate than it is to track how often I'm checking, reading Twitter. And I'm very mindful of this. You know, I have a two-year-old son, and I really, I think I've spent more time reading my Twitter timeline than I've spent reading to him since he was born. And I'm not proud of that. Like, you know, I don't like to think of myself as, his, as history's worst monster. But like, you're like, gosh, is that who I want to be? And if that is who I am, how do I justify it? Right? How am I taking my investment of that time and saying it's, it's meaningful or worthwhile? These are the vectors through which we can displace the networks that don't have the values that the open web cares about by focusing on meaning, by focusing on emotion, by focusing on expression, by focusing on the artists. These are all things that those networks are terrible on, terrible for. We have to be able to do better than them on these regards, right? If you allow one more color than blue, you're ahead of Facebook. Um, and importantly, there are institutions that care about a healthy open web. This is obviously one of them. Um, this is informed by the work that I got to do uh, with part of my nonprofit with the White House. You know, we were archiving uh, the interactions people had with the White House Twitter and Facebook accounts because the Presidential Records Act requires it. A lot of good reasons, right? You want the historical record of what the president says to the public. Now, this manifests itself in many different ways. The White House has a podcast, so you had White House interns, all of whom were probably Ivy League grads, copying and pasting iTunes con comments out of iTunes and pasting them into Word so that they would have a record of what people said about the podcast. It's like, there has to be a better way, right? Um, and we can make technology to do this. And so we did this with Facebook. Oh, we'll archive what people say on the president's Facebook wall, which is horrible. You don't want to read it. But um, has to be done. And interestingly, at the time we started doing this, this is three, maybe four years ago, um, Facebook's terms of service prohibited archiving your social graph for more than 24 hours, right? Because that had to be kept up to date for reasons, you know, for their reasons. But 
you had a direct tension between federal law and the terms of service, right? In that case, I think Facebook actually sincerely wanted to change the policy, so they, they ended up changing the policy to where you could archive it longer. But gosh, I wish they hadn't. It would have been amazing to see them shut down the White House Facebook account for violating terms of service, right? And so we have to look for these things where we can be, you know, civically active in useful ways through technology. It's fascinating to me the reverence people have for terms of service. It's not law, it's just terms of service. Like break it sometimes, see what happens. Because geeks, it's this weird thing where they see code is constantly changeable, always has bugs, something you can fix, but terms of service, this is immutable, right? This is, this is carved in stone. And so why the reverence? And it's because we haven't done a good enough job of educating people, like those will change. If you're effective enough, those will change. PR trumps terms of service 10 times out of 10, every single time. So if Instagram changes terms of service and you don't like it and you raise a big enough stink, guess what? They change it back. In that case, they probably change it back to something worse, but hey, we don't always get it right. Um, and that part of actually just being able to beat on your drum and tell a story and that trumping every other power they have has been underutilized. And it's not, it's not the same thing as SOPA and PIPA is coming and let's, let's get active on this policy. It's actually looking at ourselves and our culture as being in, negatively impacted by the terms of service, by the policies of these companies, and assuming our agency over them. We can correct things, right? And the traditional vector it's been done is through policy, through the Department of Justice issuing a consent decree, through these other mechanisms. And that's great. That's fine. But it's slow as hell. It doesn't work anywhere near as fast as the technology industry should work. Right? So we need to think about ways to galvanize and organize around effectively targeting. And it could be specific clauses in terms of service. Like what if we actually focused on Facebook's terms of service one clause at a time is in the same detailed way we do with public policy and looked for some accountability? Because right? they're not going to offer it up on their side. In fact, Facebook explicitly ended the ability of the community to vote on the terms of service and when there were changes. Now, that was a farce anyway, because it required one third of all Facebook users to agree to a change. And I don't have 300 million Facebook friends. I don't know if you do. It's a pretty hard thing to pull together. So it was always this sort of token effort. But they even eliminated the token effort at accountability. So then we have to go with what we have. The good news is, even though the terms of service and the IP policies are working together and being shaped by these companies to quiet down or eliminate any of the objections and the protests against it, people have already chosen a path of civil disobedience. The most compelling example of this I always come back to and I'm so inspired by is YouTube. If you go to YouTube and you look at content that people are illegally uploading or uploading in violation of copyright law, um, do a search for no infringement intended. It's the best for you. Uh, it's just it's poetry to me. No <laughs> infringement intended, or I don't own this. Like 12 year olds have a lot of different ways of saying, I guess they're 15 uh, in terms of their signups. But um, the, the ways that they say, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to step on your toes, and I know there's some reason I shouldn't do this, but the world needs to see this video, and I'm going to put it up here. Um, I, I'm so inspired by that because if we had. Any other context where hundreds of thousands of teenagers were assembling in public to violate federal law that didn't match the way culture worked, the way they thought culture should work, we would recognize it for what it is, which is a massive act of civil disobedience. Right? This is a million mixer march. It takes place every single day. It's people going up and saying, I know what your laws are, but I know what's right. I know what's right for me as an artist as an individual, somebody wants to express themselves in culture, and I'm gonna do what I need to do. And I'm gonna make a nod to, I don't intend to infringe, but I have to transgress because it's the thing the world needs. It's the way I need to express myself. This is speech between me and my friends, not a work for you to monetize, right? And they're doing it every single day. Ordinary people are doing this every single day. And they are violating the terms of service, and they are violating the restrictive IP laws because they don't match. That's the opportunity. That's the exciting part. People are doing this every single day. That's why I'm really, really optimistic we can find a new way. Thank you all.
Can we do some questions? Absolutely. Cool. When you do the microphone thing, so that the web can hear. Hi. I'm going to start with a narrow point, but it was the first one you brought up, so I'm going to go with it. Please. Um, if I store my wedding photos at the local U-Haul and they suddenly threw them away without telling me, that would violate various laws and I would have a civil uh, recourse mm -hmm. and it just wouldn't happen. U-Haul knows better than to do that. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't the exact same provisions apply to, to these uh, online places? I don't know. Um, I wish I did. Um, I'm certainly no legal expert. Um, I, you know, I think... There was an assumption of disposability baked into the culture of the web early on that this didn't count, this wasn't real. And I, and I think, um, I think all, almost all of digital culture, right? you see the sort of um, the sheer amount of effort going into preserving old video games. You know, it's just, it feels like that's what 20% like of Kickstarter does, it's like old video games being revived. Uh, and I think that's great, but part of it is because uh, the community of people that care about this thing has got a face-to-face -face glimpse with the threat of it being forever destroyed. Um, and, and I think that, that issue of disposability is only sort of corrected by a generation of people coming up that are in legal power and financial power enough to say, actually, digital culture is as important as everything else. Um, but there are countless disconnects between physical property law and digital property law. And right now, they only ever work in favor of the companies that want to throw our stuff away, um, as opposed to treating it as our possessions. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's extraordinary to me. And I think some of it is just the reframing. I think if, if legislators and lawmakers saw your digital shoeboxes as important as the photos in your U-Haul, or saw them as equivalent, um, but very few of us are telling them that. Okay, I see three hands. Uh, we'll stop at, the, uh, I'm sorry. We'll stop at um, quarter of, uh, quarter of First a comment, then a question. Uh, about a week ago, I was at the Kennedy School for a, uh, a seminar on uh, digital politics. And uh, the people from Facebook and Google and both of them have two different teams, one Republican, one Democrat, working with politicians, and supposedly a Chinese wall. And it was interesting to me that nobody brought up what about the interests of Facebook and Google in reference to politics, but that's my comment. Um, my question is, uh, the latest iteration of uh, uh, digital rights and, and SOPA and PIPA and all of that stuff supposedly is the terms of service become law. Yeah. That's what I read on the web. And if you say, as the emails that I get tell me, if I say that I'm 150 pounds rather than 172 on my dating profile, I, I have committed a felony. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering about that. In you know, um, to what you're talking we've about. already seen terms of service become de facto law or, you know, de jure law. I, I think with um, uh, DVD decryption and other aspects, we, we, we have policy being delegated to terms of service, and, but being enforced with the full context as if it were uh, public policy. And, and I think... Um, it's one of the great dangers of the sort of dynamic policy systems a lot of people are talking about is, that, oh, you know, we'll, we'll have things be much more responsive to what the public wants. And, um, and with those are assuming that there are healthy ecosystems for exchange that are not controlled by these companies, which seems like an increasingly bad ass assumption right now. Um, I, think it's, I think the solution, again, is in that sort of PR Trump's TOS realm. We have to find really good artists that understand these issues to demonstrate them in a cogent way. Um, I think about, you know, the artists that made good use of BitTorrent to show sort of legal uh, uses of it were very, very effective in, in keeping from criminalizing all of non-standard or peer-to-peer -peer distribution. Um, I think we need to look at something similar around um, really realizing the implications of these terms of service. I love the example of your, you know, your dating profile being, being a felony um, if you misrepresent yourself 
because certainly everybody can understand that. But you know, we we ha we have precedent going back decades of the you know your uh, your video rental history being private, right? And these are things that um, it's not a new issue. It's the scale of people that it impacts and the everyday reality of it are are what's changed. Um, the difference now is theoretically we should have more of a voice. The problem is I think we've we've abdicated a lot of our lobbying to you know the Internet Association is pretty much controlled by these these big companies. Um, uh, the, there is no there's the assumption that small startups and open web advocates have the same interests as the big companies. So we're all on the same side of I don't know H one Bs and um, you know and and net neutrality and a couple other things. So we all are in a bucket together. And I think we need to draw much broader distinctions. Like the small and the big actually have very little in common on the policy issues that matter. Hey, so I actually see three separate trends that, that are conforming here. Uh, we're losing control of our data as it's moving on these third party sites with different rules and different laws and different access. We're losing control of, of the endpoints because I no longer have the right to put whatever software I want on this. I can even write a file erasure program because I don't have access to the memory map. Mm -hmm. we're also, and the third is we're losing control of our applications. Instead of owning a copy of Word, mm -hmm. we tend to be either using a web app or licensing for use a, an app, which, which then changes. Yep. And, and the model I like, which I think is really, really powerful, is we're moving into a feudal model of computing. Yeah, yeah, very so, much so. So if I pledge allegiance to Google, they will protect me. At least that's the deal, right? But mm -hmm. in, of course, in any feudal model, they can also sell me down the river. Yeah. And if you go back to feudalism, the, the way we got out of that is we had the rise of the nation state that said to the feudal lords, you not only have these rights, but you have these responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a sort of a good overarching metaphor to describe where we are and then how to get out of it. I love that analogy. One of the things I think about a lot is who has incentives in the market to 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 overthrow that model, um, and there's a lot of different ways. You know, this is like uh, my day job is I'm CEO of a company making a software app, and it talks to Facebook's API and to Twitter's API, right? So there's this reckoning of like, I, you know, I I can you know I can say after police all I want, but there's like I have to ship software and somebody has to use it, and what am I going to do about this? And 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 one of the premises I have is um, I think you can build apps that work within their constraints, um, but don't necessarily have to follow the same path towards success being destroying their photos. Um, if, if you have these sort of economic underpinnings of building your company in a different way, if you have a, a closer alignment with what users want. And, and I think um, the feudal model, it, that's really powerful. I mean, I think it's a, it is a really um, effective analogy for, for the, the situation we find ourselves in. But I think about something like, imagine a a cloud app store. So instead of the, it running on this closed device, I run on one of these open cloud systems or on any Linux system or something. And, and again, this goes back to 10 years ago. There used to be mom and pop web hosts. Right? People would sign up for a web hosting space, you get an email address and 20 megs of storage, and, and you would you know, shoehorn your WordPress install up there, and you were good to go. Um, and that market's gone now, right? So we only have cloud computing or whatever. But there is some degree of interoperability between Amazon and Rackspace and IBM and whatever. And I picture, you know, what about an app that runs there, accessible through my browser, instead of on my phone? Because there's, there's actually much more leverage with those providers. There's much more portability with those providers. And there aren't just two players. Um, Amazon obviously is dominant, but they're, um, you know, they're sort of not even looking to control at that level. And that's interesting. And I think that, that to me feels most cyclically similar to the move from, you know, people are like, how are you ever going to unseat Windows? And, you know, and, and Microsoft bundling Internet Explorer probably did more to unseat Windows than anything else, right? And, and so like the web browser has that dis, that, just that ability to disrupt. I think that's probably part of it. Um, but there's, you know, who's going to tell a 23-year-old kid doing a startup, like, look, those per that, that somebody's dangling a quarter million dollar check in front of you but you want to take it from this other person for 200000 because they'll let you build your app this way without an architecture that's dependent on these things. I mean, that's such a rare error, you know, narrow. Like, there isn't a pithy. I think of, you know, what Lessig was doing, you know, a dozen years ago of articulating IP law to people. It was so powerful, but, like, 
it took years and years and years of him doing the best PowerPoints anybody had ever seen before anybody even understood the, the stakes. And here we have something even geekier, even wonkier, right? Even more obscure. And the time urgency is actually much faster because this isn't Disney's going to change IP law in 10 years. This is like, well, the window's going to close. Um, so I, I, I'm, and I, you know, I'm, despite that, I'm still optimistic. But I, I do think um, we are pledging the camps that we're in. And worse, um, it's also tied to fashion and to social status now. So if you don't um, agree to live within the feudal walls of Apple's kingdom, uh, you are out of fashion, right? Or maybe you know, Google or Apple are sort of your choices for a phone. And, and you, know, like you look at the sort of, uh, well, you look at the number of Apple laptops here. But you go, to, you go to a tech conference and say, oh, you know, we use Exchange and Outlook. And sort of, oh, <laughs> gosh, I'm so sorry, right? So like that, that intersection with fashion and culture is something really important and not something we talk about very much. That's all the time that we have. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.